Hello, everyone. Welcome back, uh, all the participants of Digi Futures. So it's a great honor to be here and to invite uh, our very special guest uh, tonight, um, Ayla, uh, who is uh, the former dean of um, UVA. So uh, uh, before that, uh, I want to address this uh, firstly to the whole events and brief briefly introduce Digi Futures. So this year, the topic is one planet, I think, uh, which is a, a very interesting topic we put forward based on the philosophy and all the research works we have uh, put forward over the past few years. And uh, last night, uh, we invite um, Antona Bicon from Harvard GSD, who also addressed uh, 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 his understanding on the one planet, actually, he's talking about uh, and the computational design and the, and the, the new uh, uh, artificial intelligence technology should actually um, uh, uh, engage into the environmental um, uh, 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 thinking to the whole planet. So uh, this is really special after 2020, uh, all of us uh, on this planet sharing from the COVID and also sharing from different situations, including the war, including different uh, environment, environmental problems. So it's a special moment, which we're thinking, we're thinking on the technology uh, on which uh, we should find uh, how to address our research and the motivation to the future. So this year, uh, actually, and the whole event, including different uh, uh, sessions. So firstly, from June the 13th, we start uh, this uh, doctoral uh, consortium. Uh, so at the very beginning of this consort a PhD program, actually, we uh, invited uh, uh, the frontier uh, researchers, academic, academic, academia from all over the world to give lectures. And after a few years, we find it should be contribute not only to Tongji One University. We want to share all these uh, fantastic uh, 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 academic uh, lectures to the whole world. I think, uh, for example, in China, we have more than 250 university have an uh, architect department. Most of them have no opportunity to uh, uh, audit in all this kind of uh, lecture uh, sequence. So it's kind of uh, a sharing, it's kind of um, a, a contribution to the whole academic world, not only in China, but also looking forward to influence like India, like Africa, like South America and Europe as well. So after uh, 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 11, 11 days of PhD consortium, uh, we have a CDRF conference uh, uh, next weekend, uh, which is about 42 uh, presenters will uh, turning their papers. So we have around 150 papers uh, 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 participate to, the, uh, to this, uh, to this um, uh, turning out their papers and finally we select uh, 42. So the whole day we have uh, different uh, panels, different sessions. Uh, uh, so uh, all the presenter will present their research. So topic this year is hybrid intelligence. So from the 26th to uh, July the 3rd, we'll have the workshops. So this year the workshops is really uh, special. Um, from 2020, uh, after the COVID, we find the online workshop extremely uh, 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 influential out of work. So this year, we have around more than 130 workshops in, the, uh, uh, in, in different countries, actually from 48 countries. And the instructors more than uh, 2060, and also institutions more than 140. So that will be a big party events uh, uh, next week. So uh, the most special um, speciality this year, actually uh, the Digital Future Workshop based on different language channels. We have including English, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Arabic, uh, Turkish, Japanese, Korean, so on and so forth. Uh, we have um, uh, right now around, around 12 different language channels and every channel have like 10 to 40 uh, workshops. So subdivided by different, uh, sub, uh, sub organized by different uh, hubs uh, in the world, in different cities. So we're looking forward, uh, uh, digital futures culture is growing around the world. Also UIA and, and AIA, they help us to make promotion and co-host this event 
with uh, both uh, of the other two institutions or uh, associations. So this is a three um, um, a sequence of our doctoral cons cons consortium, including the architecture philosophy and architecture theory, and also performance-based design. So Ida is actually, um, um, uh, 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 which part, I think, uh, yeah. And Shi Chao makes three lectures uh, yesterday, and uh, I'm gonna find, this is Patrick Schumacher who will make six uh, lectures, and Ayla is here today, June the 17th. So actually this, the PhD candidates here um, in Tongji from different department, and they take credits uh, uh, based on the three, uh, uh, three uh, courses. So that's like the frontier of uh, the architecture theory, philosophy, and uh, uh, design methodology. So uh, welcome, uh, participate and join us in the, uh, to this uh, doctoral consortium. And uh, another thing we also want to make promotion is this year, the speciality for the uh, platform. We try to uh, launch uh, architectural intelligence, a new journal uh, based on the collaboration uh, between uh, Tongji and the Springer uh, publisher. And the uh, August issue will be launched on uh, uh, 26 June. And the uh, Architecture Intelligence is a peer reviewed journal for the original research papers, focusing on the three uh, future scenarios, including smart habitat, uh, virtual habitat, and the space habitat, which covering the emerging digital technology in the whole life uh, circle of architecture, uh, including the simulation, optimization, construction, uh, inhabitation, so on and so forth. So uh, we we'll welcome especially the PhD candidates, PhD researchers uh, can contribute uh, uh, your uh, research process and, uh, uh, and achievements uh, to uh, architectural intelligence. So, um, um, and then uh, uh, we're coming to um, today's lecture. So uh, Ayla uh, Berman actually, who is a former Dean uh, of UVA, uh, uh, I was have a special opportunity to be invited uh, um, by uh, Ayla in 2019 to teaching as a Thomas Jefferson professor. And I experienced a very special memory in UVA. I think Ayla played a very important leadership uh, in uh, UVA. And also I think uh, his contribution to the academic uh, uh, society that uh, influence a lot of people. So the most uh, uh, special impression is um, I remember in the Christmas day, I like gave the whole faculty a special party and the, um, in the party, he actually the gift to all the, the, uh, 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 the faculties is uh, she actually um, sent the gifts as planting trees on the Lodge Ridge and Mountain, maybe every faculty, uh, one or two tree, trees. I think that's a really special memory to me because she actually really have the new understanding of the environment uh, with the new understanding of the, uh, the, the friendship inside the, the school and actually all the faculties like her a lot. I think it's like a family. It's a quite, I think UV is a very good family feeling uh, and uh, memory to me. So uh, I think uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, I want to specially <laughs> mention here and showing my special uh, uh, regard to, to, to Isla uh, for her uh, leadership, uh, leadership in uh, UVA. And uh, uh, I want to briefly introduce uh, Isla's background, who is the uh, Edward uh, Consada professor and former dean and founder and director of the Next City Institution at the University of Virginia School of Architecture and the principal of the skill shift design. She is an architect theorist and curator of architecture and urbanism, and whose research investigates the relationship between the culture and the evolution of contemporary material and spatial practice. So um, let's welcome Isla and to give uh, the influx. Uh, so this constantly, it's a good topic. Uh, we're looking forward to the lecture. So I would like to give the screen to Isla, please.
that really uh, kind and generous introduction. I'm going to just uh, share my screen. And I should note that, that even though my talk today is not directly addressing the one planet issue, uh, it's drawing a larger arc. And you will see um, through that arc, the sort of shift uh, to biotic and material uh, concerns coming from uh, computational technologies. So just give me one moment uh, to share my screen. Yeah, we can see a screen right now. Great. Everybody can see that? Yes. Great. So today I'm going to um, present an overview of my forthcoming book, uh, Flux Architecture in a Parametric Landscape, uh, that I'm doing with Andrew Cudlis, and it is a theoretical overview of the last quarter century of architectural transformation in relation to the radical evolution of computational technologies, as these have intersected with ways of thinking about encoded matter and computational craft. Now, since the mid-1990s, computational technologies uh, have catalyzed one of the most creative and prolific periods in architecture since the early 20th century. They've, they've really evolved from being what were originally representational tools invested in the depiction of pre-existing models of architectural space to become significant performative machines that have transformed the ways in which we conceive and configure space and material. And within the context of creative experimentation, these tools for design, for simulation, and for making are understood as entities that have their own logics and also hidden forms of agency that are increasing. And I should note that these computational logics are also very different from our own ways of processing information. So akin to powerful and sometimes out of control prostheses that amplify and transform the animating capacity of their users, um, you know, I, I often draw from Elaine Scarry, who talks about how we project ourselves into the world through the things that we make, and then those things literally reconstruct us over time. And we should understand that the, as the intelligence of these machines increases, we might now start considering them not just as prostheses, but also as collaborators. And these have allowed for unanticipated possibilities that have really dramatically changed the architectural landscape with dynamic forms of intelligence and generative capacities that not only emulate, but also instigate genetic evolutionary processes, these tool sets have radically altered the ways in which we integrate different kinds of information into the design process, while also altering the methodological strategies that we use to encode and configure what is an already intricate matter. Now, contemporary models of space are linked, although in a nonlinear way, to the formal spatial material and numerical logics of the tools that are used to produce them, and no longer simply importing and misusing tools and theoretical models borrowed from other disciplines, architects have now engendered and developed their own diverse suite of sophisticated concepts, tools, and ever-evolving processes. These are complex, layered, and hybridized methodologies that operate across vastly different scales, and that also engage a wide range of objects and materials from the highly refined and synthetic to the salvaged, indigenous, terrestrial, and biotic. And I'm going to argue uh, today that despite manifestos to the contrary, and I'm sure you've heard a few, uh, there is no such thing as a singular parametric, algorithmic, or computational style, but rather that the diversity of heterogeneous products that we see emerging at the intersection of computation and design is both a reflection of the rejection of the drive towards universal universality that was indicative of modernism. And in this sense is also very much in keeping with the intrinsic heterogeneity of postmodern theory and a reflection of the complexity of the advancing tools, logics and systems whose evolution is continually breeding new provisional types. 
So we can think of this as an ecology of evolving technologies that generates an endless diversity of architectural species that have some common genetic traits. And I'm gonna talk about some of these uh, common traits. And if their capacity for variation, which initially was held under the banner of mass customization, was one of the key traits of the digital revolution that was very much in opposition to the repetitive sameness and standardization of industrial production, then it is precisely this variation that is also a key characteristic of the flurry of creative products that have emerged within architecture spawned by its link to information technologies. Now, Mario Carpo has argued that this very ability is also a deep rooted ambition of architects and designers in general. And I would agree in the sense that variation and uniqueness is intrinsic to the idea of making and creativity. It is also intrinsic to the idea of authorship in the sense that it reflects the specificity of individuals who make. And it also is intrinsic to matter whose emergence is always specific to a history and to an environmental context. And I will also argue that um, although computational technologies uh, and systems in and of themselves exist outside of or are indifferent to aesthetic judgments, architecture is not, you know, and therefore the effects of computation on the discipline, and I'm talking about this outside of the computerization of the profession, which I see as something else, uh, do not exist in isolation. We're not judging the inherent capacity of the technologies in a technocratic sense. We're also not talking about them as a positivist approach to technological progress, but rather how they relate to design or to the design and making of things that have formal spatial and material attributes and their ability to contribute to the dynamic generation of new architectural models. And it's for this reason that the eight thematic logics that define the structure of the book that I'm going to present today, they have morphological attributes and they operate as a larger taxonomy of computational logics and their relationship to architectural craft. The book itself surveys over 140 projects developed by a range of authors from smaller experimental practices to large firms and advanced academic institutional research groups, a small cross section of which I'm going to present today. And I'll apologize in advance for both the scale of the cross section and the quantity of material with perhaps not enough depth given the time of what I will share, but I hope uh, at some point when the book is out that you can uh, get that and it will go into certainly more, more depth. So this project, just to give you a little back history, began many years ago with an installation and exhibition uh, in 2009 at CCA in San Francisco that I was running at the time that then evolved into a book. Um, and uh, the initial exhibition was an undulating and segmented twisted tube that was parametrically designed. It was an armature that had a hexagonal cross section and each of the tubes was made up of a series of approximately 30 vertical ribs. And these held planar segments that were canted or skewed for viewing. And this supported the exhibition content, which was an overview at the time, a much smaller uh, scaled overview of the eight thematic categories, each of which explores a set of formal and spatial logics that have been transformed through advanced computational practices. And despite the key theoretical links between these logics and the architectures they might have produced, the architectures themselves are not predetermined by these technological advances, meaning that technology always has a tenuous relationship uh, to making and design. Uh, and this, of course, is where the authors uh, always come into the process. And I should also say, nor are the thematic logics or the works that they refer to comprehensive that uh, the, the architectural objects that we've included in the investigation, we consider to be seminal examples. They are also not considered to be autonomous elements, but rather I'm looking at them as cultural artifacts whose formation methods and tools, as well as their experience, perception and meaning are tied to a broader field of cultural production. So the first, 
The first category in some ways is the simplest stacked aggregates, because we start with the idea in architecture of stereometry, because architecture is largely made up of the addition of incremental parts that always aggregate into larger assemblies. The most archaic forms of building are dependent on the simple idea of the accumulation of material. So in principle, aggregative systems begin with the repetition of the found, or as in the case of mass produced elements, the ready-made unit, where because of the residue of industrial production, each unit is essentially the same form, material, and scale uh, as its neighbor. And it's also dependent on the proximity, uh, friction, load-bearing capacity of adjacent elements to ensure the structural stability of the whole. But with the introduction of computation, two fundamental changes occurred in our understanding of stacked aggregates. The first is the reconception of the wall now as a digital surface, where the wall is no longer made up of a series of individual elements, but rather they're reconceived as an array of incremental units, each of which can be coordinated and described by numeric information. In the same way that the pixelated field of a computer image that's varied in tone corresponds to a precise matrix of discrete levels of gray. The second shift occurs through the encoding of the wall that now acts no matter what the formal or material attributes of the unit as an abstract medium or matrix that gets reconceived as a digital surface that can receive and be deformed by procedural, programmatic, and environmental forces. So for example, in an old uh, an initial project by Office Doc, Casa La Roca, the wall transforms from a solid boundary to a permeable screen to register the emergence of an outdoor courtyard that is now screened so that the highly strided method of fabrication that was responsible for the making of the individual bricks or tiles, which was a result of modern industry and its methods of fabrication, is no longer uh, reflected in the making of the wall or the surface or the space, but it's countered by a more complex and intricate form of differential aggregation that smoothly distributes variation locally and statistically. In the Tongjing Art Center, the wall gets pushed back to create an opening for entry, and another segment of the wall is stretched to become porous and to let light in. So we no longer have a door and a window, two distinct functional typologies, because these are both absorbed into the variability of the wall, where a single material system gets used to support multiple performative parameters. And in the Gentenbein Winery project by Gramatio and Kohler, the surface gets aerated, it's shaded to shade the fermentation process in the winery. It also acts pictorially to represent a basket of grapes filled with grapes that signifies the winery. And in the Mulberry Street project by Shop, and these are all different projects, but of course it's all the, about the idea of the encoding of the wall. The facade results from reinterpreting the parameters of a building code meant to support the making of classical masonry ornamentation that now gets rethought as a corbelled brick precast panels and the diagonal sloping pattern of a newly triangulated surface. In the Max Planck Institute, the wall now acts as an acoustic device. So in its multiplication and destabilization, the type of the masonry unit in each one of these projects gets defigured and is transformed into an abstract medium to receive and be deformed by extrinsic information. Homogeneous elements are therefore used to produce a heterogeneous surface or spatial condition whose complexity is now dependent on the variability and quantity of information that gets injected into and modulated across a continuous wall or spatial system. And here quality directly relies on the strategic deployment of quantity and difference within the system is the result of changes in the mode of assembly, not the changing form of individual elements. The idea of a shift from frame to fill, which is the sort of shift from the modern idea of the frame uh, to the computational idea of the fill, also marks a departure from Cartesian gridded logics and is emblematized in the digitized stack aggregate of the pixelated wall. And this finds its companion at the other extreme 
in the, this project called Rock Print, uh, which is an unrecognizable and seemingly primitive large scale volumetric aggregate that emulates a low resolution 3D printed form. Now the analog here is no longer the digital surface, but rather its material counterpart. We can think of this as a, an, an analogy to the inkjet or the 3D printer that digitally distributes material in a voxelated space. Comprised of alternating compacted layers of rock and string, the project exploits the compressive strength of gravel and the tensile strength of, of string using a method of jamming to remove the space between the rocks and increase the surface friction. But rather than using formwork that's filled with a liquid or synthetic powders that cure and harden, creating an irreversible uh, process, the robotically laid string is used as a binding agent whose precise geometrical patterning interlaced with the gravel is what is responsible for maintaining the solidity of the object of the jam structure, while also determining the filled volumes overall configuration. But unlike 3D printing, the return to ordinary raw materials enables the structure to be fully reversible. Uh, which, and unfortunately, I don't have the video for you, but if you look this up, if you haven't seen this, you know, at the very end, it's like a performance, they pull the string and the entire piece sort of unravels. What is displaced, the highly processed materials that are typical of normative construction get displaced with a far more sustainable and terrestrially based alternative, right, which is just the gravel. And this also marks a significant shift in emphasis from formal processes and properties to material ones that not only encode form, but also draw from an already encoded uh, property, the properties of raw matter. Modular assemblages, the second uh, category or the second thematic are assemblies that are composed of a family of individuated discrete yet interrelated elements. They are a study in what's called mirology, in the relationship between part and whole, because the module is simultaneously part and whole. It's both a fractional component that's intrinsically connected to the parent from which it is derived and from which it shares genetic material, but it's also uh, an independent entity that can be rearranged in a closed organizational system. So in principle, one of the key logics of modular systems is really quite simple. First divide, then recombine. Modulation adjusts the dimensional and spatial properties of an object across or along a spectrum of values, yet expresses the transformative potential of the architectural component in clearly defined increments, discrete holes in order to exploit the distributive and combinatorial possibilities of the module as it assembles into different organizational patterns. So modular assemblages adhere to five principles of com computation that are linked with media. Numerical representation, modularity, automation, variability, and the possibility of transcoding. They're inherently statistical in that they are constituted by a closed set of arrayed components that externally refer to a larger informational set. And depending on the complexity of the variables within the system, they can also be understood as visually legible manifestations of the data required to produce them, whose elements are, are rarefied along a reduced spectrum of values so, so that their differentiation within the assembly is readily apparent. Now, historically, we all know the modular by Le Corbusier, who attempted to realign abstract forms of measurement with the dimensions of the body. And this expresses the desire of the modulus to establish a, an organic continuum of relations across a range of variable elements, each of which exhibits a particular degree of difference with respect to the others, the other elements within the system, but it's always a family of genetically shared, uh, uh, of elements that share genetic traits. Now, the interesting thing about modular systems is that they can take any form. They're determined by relationships, not by the form of an individual element. So 
In the Ravensbourne School, for example, by Foreign Office Architects, they used a modular system of tessellated aluminum tiled uh, cladding elements. And these were just three different, uh, differently colored and shaped tiles, but they're interrelated by the single dimension that all the sides of the pentagonal and triangular tile share. So the side dimension, you'll see this uh, in the facade is always the same, as is the relationships of their interior angles that enable them to aggregate to fill a plane. The component parts within a modular system share a form of genetic ancestry, and yet they've been modified to adapt to different purposes. So despite their relative independence and compartmentalization, modules are always co-evolutionary, and they're, they're necessarily therefore interdependent when they operate within a larger system. And this is exemplified in Moss's ivy coat hook system, whose patterns of growth are controlled through a simple set of rules and operations, what's called an organic growth algorithm that simulates the potential of the artifact as it grows over time. This simulation uses weighted probabilities to determine from which of the connectors of the coat rack system, the device will grow, a condition that in its real application might be dependent on things like the proportions and scale of the wall to which it attaches, the number of pieces of clothing that it's intended to support, the size and aesthetic preferences of the family with which it interacts, uh, et cetera. Indeterminacy is part of modular systems. And this is shown in Bloom Game uh, by Jose Sanchez and Alyssa Andrusek. And this is given by the fact that the modules can be assembled without definitive limits on their quantity or placement, similar to botanical structures whose branching systems are ultimately dependent on external environmental factors. The presence of water, nutrients or light, for example, for their expansive development. In architectural models, these limits might be set by very different conditions. They can be set by site constraints, programmatic demands or desires, environmental issues, the availability of capital, et cetera, all of which are external to the modular system. And the inversion of bottom up extensive modular systems like uh, Ivy and the Bloom game is found in this project, which is called emerging by emerging objects called seat slug, where a very a high degree of customization, both at the level of the configuration of the larger object and of the component part hides its initial modularity. You can sense it, you can see it, uh, but the understanding of the module is not as clear. The module is a repeated component that supports a highly particularized surface pattern. And here the module is a basic unit. It's a single rectilinear cell within a gridded geometry that is transformed when the initial grid is distorted through a mesh that defines now the plastic volume of the serpentine seating element. And although far more complex in its surface patterning because of the biomorphic irregularity of its design, the seat slug operates in a similar way to what are called truchet tiles um, with two different scales of modulation. One that defines the repetitive pattern of meandering lines and amoeba shaped perforations on the surface, uh, a logic that's determined by the tiling and the other that defines the scale of the actual 3D printed cement blocks. And in the case of truchet tiling, it's a simple pattern where the tile then just gets rotated and produces then a continuous pattern. But like the Bloom game, the high degree of customization of the module diminishes its legibility. So in one case, this is due to the complexity. So in the case of Bloom game, for example, uh, this is because of the module's external configuration, which is highly complex. Uh, its actual shape is highly complex. And in the case of the seat slug, uh, it's due to the internal uh, configuration, as well as the high degree of customization that diminishes its legibility. So it's the degrees of freedom in the one case that allows for its aggregation and growth. But in the case of the seat slug, it's the internal intricacy in combined with the larger deformation of the whole. 
Finally, modular systems, although they are relational, like computer modeling space, they are entirely scaleless. The resolution wall that I showed you initially by Gramatio and Kohler exploits the lack of scale by using it to produce higher degrees of resolution in the same way that the pixelated surface supports an image. So when we talk about something that has a lack of resolution, it means that uh, it has less information, uh, but it also means that the components are, at, are operating uh, seemingly at a, um, at a larger scale. And for Gilles Retzen, although the number of types in his projects is very small, in both cases, the resolution in scale of discrete modules changes dramatically when you move from the top project, which is the Diamonds House, to the Talon Pavilion, as the number of elements is radically reduced and the scale of individual components gets increased. This calls attention to the discreteness of the part, and it's also its relationship uh, to other parts within the system. The third category, pixelated fields, uh, engenders a shift from frame to fill and from object to field. So it moves away from strategies related to the, the binding or delimitation of space to those that operate through occupation, through scattering and distribution. Controlling a space by populating it, we can think of this the way a city gets populated, rather than defining its boundaries. The pixelated field finds its direct correlate in the bitmap surface that translates real matter into numerically coded bits of information. So in early projects, like in the de Young Museum, for example, by Herzog and Demeron, the pixelated envelope of the building is the result of a digital diagram that filters contextual site information. Material is literally sampled and transformed. And in this case, it was the tree canopies that you can see on the upper left. They're photographed, they're computationally transformed as a method to reinterpret context in the making of the permeable copper skin for the museum. In the Agbar Tower by Jean Nouvel, the iconic image of a geyser erupting that served as an inspiration for the project merges now with other contextual information from the mountain of Montserrat in Barcelona and Gaudi's Sagrada Familia and the polychrome of the Catalan facades to the patterning of the surrounding urban fabric that gets mapped, literally mapped onto the facade of the building. And here the pixelated field gets used as a, a mediating digital device that's employed to transcode this kind of contextual imagery which is then folded back onto the surface of the tower that itself becomes a full-scale architectural digital display. As the number of dimensions and degrees of freedom of the pixelated field increase, so does the potential complexity of the field that's produced. So in the Kite Workshop by Junya Ishigami, the pixels get extruded to create a field of 305 slender white steel columns. And here where you see a kind of a planimetric view uh, of the columns, each of these is defined by a changing set of parameters. Within the building, space gets defined not by walls or rooms, not by boundaries or enclosures, but instead just by the changing density of the field where gaseous clouds of points in plan and ethereal lines that are almost not unseen in elevation accumulate and form fuzzy zones of occupation where the constellations of activity now occur. The expansion of the pixelated field into three dimensions generates what we call volume elements or voxels, which are atomized components of volume that are used to fill rather than frame space. So in MVRDV's Porous City and Sky Village projects, the idea of the voxel field acts as a spatial representation of the architectural artifact, as well as a 3D datascape of the changing parameters that are influencing its design. Where, for example, the cubic pixel is a symbolic mathematical variable that refers to the minimum amount of space required to support a housing unit or an office space, whose position, orientation, and distribution are now based on statistical desires that define the whole. The atomization of space enacts a three-dimensional digit 
conceptualization of all contextual programmatic or techn technological requirements so that these can be algorithmically responded to through the addition, erasure, scaling, or the redistribution of voxels. In the Porous City Skyscrapers project, the distinction between solid and void or interior and exterior, as well as public and private space, gets eliminated by the equalizing in a way of all conditions of space given in advance by space being divided into a voxelated field, right? Whether it is a solid or void pixel in a way. Um, it, it's also, we could say, a larger effort to inject public space, which is traditionally relegated to the horizontality of the ground plane into the verticality of a dense skyscraper as an attempt to equalize the private and public domains. The voxel field here expands the surface area of the planet, we could say, into a thicker zone of inhabitability and enables now the aeration of this zone, access to outdoor space or access to light and air, by increasing the surface area of the perimeter of the skyscraper without increasing its volume in the same way uh, that your lungs operate to increase the number of exchanges across cells, but compacted within uh, a, limited, a limited space. And in the computational chair design project uh, by EZCT, the field is the direct result of an automatic computational method that's intended to displace design authorship with machinic processes that artificially simulate evolutionary development with the intention to literally breed a population of pixelated chairs to to think of the voxel field through genetic algorithms the genetic transmission of traits from parent to child gets synthesized with procedures that simulate the potential for random mutations and natural selection those that assess the adaptive fitness of the individual chairs generated to their function or environment. And through computational evolution, the chair's pixel field is progressively eroded with the intention of breeding as a kind of test or experiment, the lightest object constructed out of the smallest number, number of voxels that's able to withstand the static load of a sitting body. Now, the intention of this experimental process uh, and uh, I think it went through literally 32,000 uh, iterations, is not to optimize the development of the artifact, but rather to create using artificially intelligent but unpredictable growth models, a series of objects whose formal definition moves outside of our own design preconceptions. And in so doing, to create in a way a form that for us is literally unimaginable in advance uh, of its computational procreation. And I think this is one of the key pieces or one of the key takeaways uh, from the project. Cellular clusters, this, the shift to cellular projects, which occurred with the rediscovery of the Voronoi also marks an important overlay emerging between uh, computational and biotic systems, since cells, bubbles, crystals, and honeycombs are the basic elements uh, of all biological, chemical, geological, and geometric systems. They're additive or divisible systems that are made up of discrete components that have varying degrees of continuity and proximity, but they are all inevitably ordered according to their potential spatial juxtapositions resulting from the ba their boundary conditions and geometry, in addition to the density of interrelated elements in the system. The cell is simultaneously related to, yet differentiated from, the larger organizational structure that it supports, meaning that the shape, for example, of the table in this case uh, by Aranda Lash is different to the shape of the individual elements uh, that uh, that it's constituted by in the same way that the shape of our own bodies is different to the shape of the cellular organization of which we are made, right? Uh, and this we can see in many of these projects, uh, such as the water cube in Beijing, the cube or the rectilinear cell that uh, makes up, um, that is made up of the cellular cluster is different 
to the actual structure that supports it, uh, which, which is intended to be a suspended state of a foaming liquid that moves between liquid and gaseous states that produces a cube of water that houses now an aquatic program. And here the cellular structure, which is actually a variation of a weir phalen model, a geometric uh, solid of two very regular uh, or irregular, I should say, of polyhedral cells of equal volume. These packed cells get rotated in the project by 60 degrees so that their elevations revealed through the kind of sectional slicing of the project would appear to be far more erratic to reference nature's ability in some ways to conceal the geometric coating of its cells and bubbles behind the irregularity of its appearance. Cellular clusters are ground up phenomena that are determined by local rather than global ordering uh, parameters, but they still operate at the scale of the whole by distributing forces in a nonlinear way. In multicellular organisms, for example, cells pack together to form an intricate yet very differentiated morphology of tissue structures whose function is dependent on this variability. And the material response to external pressures and adaptation to specific environmental conditions like air force, gravity, or pressure occur through the distribution of local cellular differentiation within particular zones or regions of the cluster, which maintain the continuity of the whole. And you can see this as an example uh, within Voromuro, which is an installation project, but the whole changes, even though the cells at, that uh, the project initially starts from uh, are similar. Cellular structures derived from processes of tessellation operate through minimal surface enclosures and maintain no or minimal gaps between cells, but clusters in general can establish different degrees of porosity. They can be in close contact or there can be wide intracellular spaces depending on the stability, coherence, and density of the system. The next uh, category or taxonomy I'm going to talk about is serial iteration and serial repetition was perhaps one of the most dominant models of modern thought, engendering an entirely new mechanistic and cinematic world that was based on the idea that both space and time were homogeneous and infinitely extensive and could be divided ad infinitum into an endless series of intervals. That serial structures are still so pervasive in so many aspects of contemporary architectural work from the serial splines of computer models to the tool paths and print layers evident in objects that are printed and fabricated with CNC mills and 3D printers is evidence in a way that these technologies and practices that they've spawned are less a break with history than the outcome of its dynamic evolution. The key transformation to the way we think about surreality that occurred with computation, however, resulted from three related phenomena. First was the introduction of algorithmic differentiation into the repetition of serial elements that produced variation while still maintaining continuity. The, the second was the ability to model complex curvilinear volumes with a high degree of precision, <clears throat> which before computation, uh, was impossible. And the third was the shift from strategies of framing to filling space that was made possible by the ever increasing reduction of the size of the interval and the ability to compute enormous quantities of data and prototype at extremely high speeds. And this is really made explicit in Michael Hansmeier's subdivided column project where the 6 million faces of an intricate 3D model get serially intersected with planes that are translated into one millimeter thick CNC milled uh, ABS sheets that would never have been possible uh, without computation. These conditions enabled by computation are what allowed for the overlay of Cartesian and topological models 
by ensuring that the complex unfolding of a surface or a volume could still be thought through linear and planar systems that reference in a way, and this is the importance that they reference the long-standing plans and sections of the history of architectural drawing and construction. Yet where traditionally the plan and section were understood to be originary orthographic planes of projection, privileged instance, for example, that preceded the making of architecture before they were extruded, the emergence of the serial section marks a critical shift in design practice because now it's used as a descriptive not as a projective device. It became a method to incrementalize and sectionalize, uh, sectionally describe the spatial complexity of complex curvilinear surfaces and volumes whose very spatiality would render them irreducible to orthographic projection in the same way that a 3D printed model that you can print anything at all of any shape essentially, uh, even though you are doing it through what is the microscopic layering uh, of, uh, of sections. And this was also simultaneously a strategy to directly translate these spatial forms into a constructive logic by exploiting and redeploying industrial sheet materials in an effort to generate a new landscape of artifice and matter while also attributing an animate thickness uh, to both space and time. In the same way that the geomorphic layering of sediment in the ground, space is defined by the material that fills it, where the intensive layering of sections refers in some ways to the micro and macro scales of matter. So in this project, for example, Rip Curl Canyon by Balnohez, it's a synthetic landscape. It's made out of cardboard, corrugated cardboard, and it's aggregated out of a limited set of profiles, three different types that are cut from a ready-made uh, dimensional sheets. Rather than signifying the, the strided systems from which the project emerged, the project's innovation is in its capacity to find the geometric limits of these systems in the same way that a continuous series of points, of discrete points in space, if they are close enough together, proximate and numerous enough, they can be connected to produce a curved line, right? Any, a set of discrete uh, incremental axial translations and rotations. And here, all that they are doing is taking the section and rotating it and moving it up and down. In, in a way, microscopic movements that only happen in two different uh, ways, but it's about the quantity, right? The quantity of changes, because if they're individually small enough and collectively numerous enough, they can be aggregated to approximate what appears to be a spatial curve linear path. Serial repetition, like the cinematic capturing of motion and form, registers incremental changes across the whole by revealing the multiplicity of traces that represent distinct moments within a continuous series. And just as the striated Cartesian system that structures the bitmap field of the computer screen is always hidden, right, behind the intensity of its images, so too are the composite horizontal layers that are generated by rapid prototyping technologies res rendered visually undetectable when they're embedded within the topological surfaces that they produce. But where the first generation of serial projects animating architecture, uh, animated architecture through formal variation, the next generation, and I'm talking about the next generation of architects, shifted toward the inherent variability of material itself by exploiting the increasing complexity of the evolving tools in conjunction with an already encoded matter by doing things like adjusting the path, the rhythm, and the speed of material extrusion to exploit, for example, in this project by Andrew Cudlis, the micro looping of bioplastic in the printing of the strand table so that the print, the layers of the print loop and drop. Or um, in the case of the concrete choreography project that was done at the ETH, the natural slumping of concrete uh, that augments the serial layering of the 3D 
printing process. So now we're trying to expose the process, the making, and expose the material that was once hidden behind the smoothness of the intricate volumetric forms that it could produce. And the material experimentation found in Casa Cavita and Mud Frontiers, which uses natural, indigenous, and wild materials to produce ecologically compatible full-scale 3D printing constructions in the same way, for example, that the rock print uh, tried to produce a reversible process so that it could be more ecological. And here you find uh, the, in the making of the embodied computation lab, uh, at Princeton uh, by the living, which uses now salvaged boards, the debris of construction and custom algorithms to detect and CNC blasting to expose and make performative the natural variable seriality that is already evident in the grain of wood. And this seriality, unlike industrial seriality, is an index of the environmental history that animated the tree's growth and later its decay, exposing a very different form of seriality and animation, but one that is now intrinsically tied to the encoding of matter. Woven meshes, or the rise of woven systems, emerged in concert with the displacement of the, of the modern grid by complex meshworks and rhizomes. And we could see the complex meshworks and rhizomes as, as signifying or finding their analogs in the stranded connectivity of both natural artifacts, biotic artifacts that are made up of stranded systems, as well as the highly technological networked uh, culture. And these are in some ways the two references, the biotic and the technological that come together uh, with woven systems. Weaving functions through interlocking, through the intertwining of distinct strands in a system that stabilize these strands that would otherwise lack coherence or rigidity and where stability is achieved less by the regularity or irregularity of the system than by its potential entangling, its knotting or intersection of distinct fibers. In architecture, we see the analog through trusses, lattices, geodetic systems that have conventionally operated to distribute forces like in a woven basket or fabric according to the geometry of the weave. But in contrast, complex woven structural systems like those that Herzog and Demeron used in the Beijing National Stadium tried to misalign the true functioning of the assembly in relation to its perceptual effects, to try to undermine our expectations for a stable and ordered uh, tectonic. Now, this is a strategy that Toyo Ito also used in the Serpentine Pavilion. In this project, rather than starting with a highly regular structure that gains complexity over time, it begins with a complex knotted mesh, a sketch which then gets rationalized through a fractal system. With the intention to undermine the culture of stasis to which architecture's foundations are wedded and to contest the assumption that we have that structural integrity is necessarily conjoined with the perception of clearly ordered systems. So the application of weaving to space happened through a couple projects through topological continuity of tubular structures. And here we find a different kind of weaving uh, in the evolution of projects like the Taichung Opera House and also the complex tubular networks of Mark Forns of the very many each of which translates the weave into a thickened tubular lattice that shifts the emphasis from the strand to the changing form or the radii of the apertures as, as they are projected along these strands in the making of a torus. The return to more literal forms of weaving stranded systems that were inspired by biomimetic morphological principles and that radically expanded this paradigm using robotic fabrication methods and kyber, uh, carbon fiber reinforced polymers are found in a number of pavilions that were done by uh, the ICD ITKE research uh, group at the University of Stuttgart uh, between 2017 or 2012 to 2017. And these projects, just like Jenny Sabin's polymorph, 
are dependent on the integration of rigid structures within the system, either globally, as in the steel formwork for the pavilions, or locally, as in the digitally printed ceramic modules of polymorph. And these rigid components act um, operating compression that complement the tensile capacity of the weave. And we could say as a companion to polymorph, this project by Alyssa Andrasek that was uh, done for, for the Croatian National Pavilion called Mathematized Cloud, Cloud Pergola, is a highly complex meteorological storm taking its inspiration uh, from nature, but it's simulated from algorithmically weighted swarming vectors that replace the intertwining of distinct fibrous strands with a voxel lattice made from a single robotically extruded uh, thermoplastic filament that is simultaneously liquid and solid. It literally gets drawn in the air by a robot and hardens over, over time. And this project in some way reinvents the architectonic geometry of the lattice by layering the complexity of a highly mobile multi-agent system with the intricacy of a robotically crafted high precision microstructure, bringing architecture closer to the performance found in natural systems through the innovative application of new forms of computational craft. And finally, a project that moves to the far extreme that is truly what, what I would call a multi-agent biotechnological system, uh, that operates very much in the way that um, Donna Haraway talks about establishing kinship uh, with uh, zoological systems that not only is informed by natural systems, but also co-produces with them, where Neri Oxman and MIT's Mediated Matter Group's Silk Pavilions, they not only incorporate an algorithm that's based on the movement of silkworms to form a woven substructure of the pavilion, but they also incorporate literally a swarm of 6,500 living silkworms in the construction of two large architecturally spun silk cocoons. So when I said that computers become our potential collaborators on the technological side, so do we need to be looking to nature to understand another group of collaborators if we are really to think about uh, one planet in the future. Emergent surfaces, uh, the, the next category we could look at as a bringing forward of material conditions. One of the most dominant shifts of the last 20 years has been the move from an emphasis on form to an emphasis on matter that coincided with the intersection of computational technologies with material and biological systems. So if the abstraction of modern architectural systems constrained matter by subjecting it to the limits of an idealized geometry, it was an indication that the dominant ideology of modernism subscribed to what we call the principles of a hylomorphic model, that matter is essentially understood to be formless, and it's only by the overlay of geometry that provides matter with its formal definition and structure. So forms that are geometrically derived as a function of shape generators rather than by material forces as a consequence, the architectures resulting from pure formal manipulation are inevitably unrelated to the matters that fill them. You know, in, in modernism, uh, the plane, a Cartesian plane, could be made up of any material. It didn't matter what the material was, and those planes could be interchanged, right, just as surface effects within the Cartesian system. But contemporary practices that exploit the potential of material systems follow uh, a, an entirely different trajectory, one that follows the experimental evolutionary trajectory of people like Gaudi, Heinz Eisler, Fry Otto, Felix Candela, uh, and others. Works like this, Maximilian Schell by Bal Nohez, that follow this trajectory investigate the deployment of minimal membranes to an aggregated rather than continuous skin, 
subscribe to a different set of principles based on the notion that matter is already encoded and has its own capacity for self-expression and self-organization. Catenary systems, for example, were originally based on hanging chain models, right? Hanging chain models that then get frozen and flipped upside down, where the shape of the curvature of a hanging chain becomes a direct expression of the material forces in the system. The incorporation of digital design tools like the ones like catenary by Axel Killian simulates the physics of a membrane system. And this enabled the next generation of catenary structures. This is a structure uh, called feathered edge uh, by Bal Nohez, which is just made of hanging string, right? And, and it gets applied to a wider range of spatial and material explorations. One of the most compelling examples of emergent behavior that it evolving at the nexus of matter and computation that also capitalizes on this idea of maximizing the minimal is uh, through a series that um, known as P-Wall by, by Maxis, by Andrew Cudlis, that follows an, the experimental tradition of Miguel Fizak and that reconceives the planarity, the plane of the white wall of the typical architectural surface. Each wall is composed of a tessellated pattern of cast tiles generated by pouring plaster and in later versions concrete into modular flexible forms composed of spandex lycra fabric that stretched across a field of vertically oriented wooden dowels. The final project is revealed therefore through a form finding project. Andrew had no idea what would be produced and of course Experiments always have failed experiments as part of their process, but he's directly engaging the real properties of material, where the surface, the final surface in the end, is an index of these interacting material forces and constraints, rather than being produced by an imposed geometry that gets set in advance. The lineage of Otto and Candela extended by new computational design tools and fabrication technologies is perhaps best exemplified in the full-scale experimental projects by the Block Research Group uh, at the ETH, where, for example, Otto Friotto's cable net tensile structures and Candela's shells uh, find their genetic progeny in Knit Candela and the Hilo Roof 2 projects uh, by BRG, which are freeform concrete shells constructed using a suspended cable net false work system and a fabric formwork to support and mold the shell. And one of the most important contributions to this process to form finding has been the development of interactive computationally driven form finding design tools that pr produce geometric visualizations of force, right? Aligning the tools more directly with intuitive, formal, and spatial design processes. And the use of these tools in concert with material experimentation is evident in the spectacular armadillo vault that was constructed um, uh, by the BRG, led by uh, Philippe Bloch, constructed for the 2016 Biennale. And this structure, which is a freeform doubly curved vault, is made up of mortar-free, dry assembled discrete pieces of stone with a thickness that's proportional to less than one half of that of an eggshell. And it's an explicit material manifestation, not simply of the primacy of geometry when brought into relation with force, right? But its potential when linked with the intrinsic capacity of matter to self-organize by aligning form and force. And this exposes what is truly an endogenous, expressive, and encoded matter based uh, architecture, and what this might become if we think about this in relation to a uh, future. The last, uh, the last category or taxonomy I'm going to talk about uh, today is multi agent networks. And these are intrinsic to both natural populations, as well as intelligent decentralized systems composed of discrete elements, each of which acts as uh, an independent actor within a larger dynamic collective. And these systems 
generate complex global behavior that emerges through the interactive agglomeration of a very simple set of local rules that are applicable to each agent within the network. So within the design disciplines, swarm behaviors initially evolved from computer simulations of swarming, schooling, and flocking activities of insect, fish, and bird migrations, uh, originally by Craig uh, Reynolds, uh, his Boyd's project, and later uh, by others uh, like Aranda Lash. Uh, and these became paradigmatic models for rethinking architecture and urbanism as dynamic multi-agent systems where the complexity of their global parameters and patterns and performative capacities emerge from a few simple local interactive rules. And, and the application of these networks to architecture have produced a wide range of practices, many of which fall into three broader categories that uh, I'll uh, briefly present. The first, what I call multi-agent matters, applies to swarm logics that get applied to the making of architecture as a continuous process. So um, Alyssa Andrasek's uh, project, Mathematized Cloud or Cloud Pergola, uh, is one of these uh, projects, for example, or uh, Francois Roche, his project I've heard about, which is akin to the making of a termite mound that evolves over time, but remains continuous uh, and is literally a direct, um, uh, direct instantiation of the movements uh, that were part of the logic that made it. Nary Oxman Silk Pavilion, we could also say, is a multi-agent system, but it uses living rather than computationally generated swarm behavior. The second group uh, of multi-agent systems is less continuous than the first. They're a form of multi-agent urbanisms that are focused on the collective emergence and behaviors of populations, of vehicular infrastructures, of building clusters, or territorial elements whose interaction are determined by algorithms that are calibrated to environmental influences. Now these can instigate a range of potential settlement scenarios. So the rules get set and settlement scenarios then get tested through a form of swarm behavior that in some ways is, um, is modeling the inherent swarm behavior of populations in a city. And these develop uh, can be developing, used to develop optimized systems of distribution, like a branching network to establish infrastructural connectivity or the cellular allocation of building plots uh, in the making of a city. The third group of multi-agent systems are what we often know, uh, think of as interactive projects, right? Local behaviors uh, that applies local behaviors to programmed elements operating within real time. Now, this is evident in interactive projects that are, are equipped with embedded responsive capacity, like Howler and Yoon's windscreen that provides a changing luminous uh, index of air movement, or two projects by Future Form, Form, and Light Swarm, the latter of which uh, capture sound from the city through sound sensing spiders that are distributed across the facade while the components uh, rotate to underscore the directionality of the swarm's movement in relation to the intensity of sound. And the last project that I'm gonna show you today, uh, Urban Syncopation, which is one of our projects um, in Toronto that transcodes sensory data that's drawn from across the city and that retransmits this in a rhythmic syncopated fashion it uh, retransmits what I'll call the city's collective heartbeat as this is interwoven with the reflected movements that are happening in the immediate environment of the gallery. So the shift from what were highly localized to more extended forms of network interactivity gets exemplified in this project where each of, and this is an elevation, each of the six horizontal pixelated strata that constitute the wall receives data from a different downtown Toronto site. And the wall system, whose arrangement corresponds to the sequencing of streets from which the data was collected, referencing the layered streets, the urban grid, and also in its surface, the shifting topography of the city, 
while concurrently extracting sensory information that's drawn from the city's public spaces that becomes now an index of the dynamic conditions of, of their inhabitation. The city in some ways is a perfect example of a multi-agent network or a multi-agent system itself. It's understood to be simultaneously material and performative. It's a physical artifact as well as an infrastructure or a stage for the more ephemeral activities and events of urban life to take place. And these more fleeting conditions of urbanity get captured in the piece itself. Um, I don't have a video of it to show you, but the light uh, flickers and syncopates across the wall in relation to the movement of people that are happening and the sounds out in the city. Um, and this happens both through the wall's materiality and geometry, because the folded mirror surface passively reflects, refracts and fragments the surrounding motion of the visitors that become the actors and audience within the gallery space, while it's transcoding sound data that comes from different parts of the city uh, that's collected using sound sensors that are located along five uh, streets, urban corridors, and it gets transcoded into the streaming flow of syncopated bands of pulsing light that then gets reflected back outside uh, to the city itself uh, through the wall of the gallery. Now, multi-agent systems are decentralized organizations that operate as multiplicities and are irreducible to the aggregation of individual acts. Although from a perspective of architecture and urbanism, much of the research on multi-agent systems is still very much in its infancy in relation to the complexity of the biotic, the social or the ecological living systems it hopes to emulate, the, very, the vast range of scales and potential applications of responsive systems and multi-agent uh, networks indicate the many territories uh, within which such research and design is currently unfolding. So as a, as a kind of summary or recap, if within the industrial paradigm, the intent of automated processes was to capture frame and functionalize time and space through repetition, the intense variability and diversity that now characterizes the complexity of these works really for me becomes a reaffirmation of life in their capacity for improvisation and evolution and the seemingly limitless range through which this is expressed. Here we could say incarnated form serves as potential matter for a new operation that foregrounds animate and living rather than mechanistic qualities. So if the utilitarian efficiency that once characterized the earlier technocratic impulse necessitated the elimination of things like the animate, the aleatory, and the effective. Its return in these contemporary computational works in some way signifies what I will call a profound politics of the living as it links up with a new form of machinic and aesthetic complexity. They are perhaps arguments for me for experimentation that operates in direct relation to the real, acknowledging not only the capacity of computation brought into relation with the complexity of form and the thickness of matter, but also the role of the real and of living matter, biotic matter, as sites of invention from which new architectural logics, systems, and perceptions uh, might arise. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, I'll conclude my uh, talk. And thank you for, for your patience. Thank you. Thanks a lot to Ayla. Uh, it's a great uh, book. We take a pre, uh, preview uh, for the for in, influx, which is uh, like a constant transformation uh, over the past uh, uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, uh, actually, it's like a, a lexicon uh, of the parametric history, actually, uh, uh, a generation of architect and researchers actually uh, make research and uh, also category the, a lot of uh, uh, possibilities, actually, which I, I can define, which is quite a kind of uh, material intelligence which embedded in the uh, architectural education 
uh, over the past uh, decades, uh, uh, one decade. I think it's extremely meaningful uh, uh, to all the uh, researchers and the community. Uh, actually, um, I think uh, the category is quite interesting, which is a little bit like, um, firstly, it's not just a geometry, architectural geometry based subdivision or category of the whole book, but also I think it's based on the, uh, the grammar or the, uh, the ways how you organize on how to, uh, to, uh, to um, address all these geometries uh, to find the new relationship to each other, which is totally a computational uh, 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 grammar based uh, relationship. Uh, from a very linear, like uh, the stacks or the uh, 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 cluster relationship to the multi-agent, which is a totally uh, computational, unlinear uh, 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 algorithms, uh, the relationships uh, between different agency that is much more complicated and intelligent uh, 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 relationship to the different agents. I think um, the hierarchy of the geometry and the relationship is growing from uh, uh, one dimension to net dimensional and to multi-dimensional uh, possibilities. So I have some questions. The first thing I, I would like to, uh, to ask you, you mentioned the, the early expansion in CCA, I think, which is a Canada-based uh, museum which play a very important role uh, in review and in the history of digital in architecture. Actually, actually this is, uh, it was the other CCA, uh, California uh, College of the Arts in San Francisco that I was directing at the time. Yes, and yes. and uh, so it's, it's what we call the other CCA, but we, uh, we did the exhibition uh, at the time, it was in concert with the 2009 Smart Geometry Conference that was happening in San Francisco that year. So, you know, in many ways, the, the exhibition was the sort of beginning of the project, you know, mm -hmm. and the book in some ways is, is the end or frames it, uh, yeah. and it tracks a longer trajectory. But uh, even though I'm in Canada at this point. Okay, okay, I understand. So, uh, because we, I have a, a close friend whose name is Carl Chu, I don't know if you remember. Yeah, he, I know Carl, yes. He, he actually um, gave uh, 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 lectures to Digital Future Community years ago, uh, and he mentioned um, his admirement, uh, 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 respect to the CCA expression to him, uh, I think uh, that's a special memory. So it's a different CCA, but uh, I, I remember your uh, director of it uh, from the, I think it's a long time before you become the Dean of, of yeah. uh, right? So uh, the community uh, actually, I think most of the accounting figures uh, actually already gave us a, a, a lot of uh, lectures over the past 10 years, I think, uh, which is a community of uh, practitioners um, um, uh, and believe in two things. One is like a computational uh, intelligence, which is from the algorithms to right now, it's like uh, artificial intelligence, which is like a, a black box predictive uh, design process. And then uh, on the other hand, I think uh, uh, all these kind of examples, categories should base on the, the physical fabrication. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, you'll highlight all the, uh, the categories of examples. Uh, I think all of them are the uh, material uh, mm -hmm. process uh, to reorganize the, the possibilities for the spatial or the uh, material um, uh, reorganization process uh, uh, in architecture. So first question, could you give us some, your thinking on the material intelligence mm -hmm. and also someone mentioned e-material intelligence. That is uh, very abstract, especially goes to virtual uh, aspects in architecture. Could you make your, uh, some introduction on your understanding uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to talk about these two ideas to us? Sure, so, so I said at the beginning, um, you know, it, that part of the reason that I'm framing it, the way that I'm framing it is that uh, I'm an architect and we're operating, you know, this is happening within an architectural context. And the importance of that for me, because I was saying that, you know, um, that computational processes and modes of operation are not analogous to our own, right? 
And Mario Car Carpo talks about this quite a lot, right? Uh, they're not uh, the same as ours. And, and for me, it's not about how we emulate them, right? But rather how they link up with our material processes. So, you know, some architects will say that because um, computation is indifferent to aesthetics, that we ourselves, for example, should be indifferent to aesthetics. And my position is exactly the opposite. It's that because architecture is an aesthetic act, you know, and aesthetics and perception uh, are part of the ways in which we operate. It's not just how the computer perceives something, right? It is how we perceive it uh, working with uh, computation in that process. So, so that's, uh, for me, uh, that's one of the frames that I'm using. And it's part of the reason that highlighted within the book itself are material objects and material processes, because these are the processes that we are operating with now as, as architects. And it's not to say that there isn't, let's say, an entirely parallel universe that I'm mm -hmm. sure Patrick Schumacher is talking about in relation to the virtual world that we might be operating within as well. But my focus in this has to do with a kind of uh, materiality. The, the second, the notion of material intelligence um, or what I referred to, you know, referred to as the endogenous factors of material uh, are a very different way of thinking about matter. Uh, and it's not to say that, um, that endogenous matter doesn't have its own structures that are part of its processes, but I think that what computation has enabled us to do is to, is to learn about in some ways that complexity through experimentation with the real. So when I, when I use um, Philippe Bloch's work uh, at the ETH as an example, you know, he's, he might be using in some ways archaic systems like funicular vaults and compression only structures uh, to, but he's also using computational models but says that those computational models in some ways also have to relate to us. They have to, um, they have to be models that can be intuitive, you know, because the interface here is important. If they're not intuitive uh, and they become entirely numerical, then we lose our ability to actually interact with them as, as let's say as prostheses. But material logics for me, um, you know, and, and I should say that uh, this started many years ago with my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation uh, at Harvard was called From Grid to Matrix, you know, and it was, and matrix here was understood not just as a kind of mesh or network or new way of understanding the grid, but it was the idea that the matrix has multiple meanings. It comes from, it comes from the word matter, mother mater, you know, it's considered the matrix of the earth, uh, but it has to do with complex forms of logic that are part of material systems. And I think that we have only started to scratch the surface in some ways of understanding how those logics uh, operate. Um, and that computation um, has an interesting relationship to it because we can simulate it in order to understand it uh, but we shouldn't be thinking about its displacement. Rather, we should be thinking about how we how we think about uh, computation as a as a way of complexly interacting with uh, these kinds of material systems and these kinds of behaviors. Um, mm -hmm. You know that that I would start with. So followed by your uh, um, um, argument, I think uh, you mentioned about the. Uh, subjectivity. I think uh, the human is still a very important uh, perspective to looking into the materiality. So I think uh, the subjectivity of designers, uh, for example, they should uh, uh, address their ideas in collaboration with some tools. Uh, computation is kind of tools. They, they should set up, uh, they should establish and uh, follow by some um, code and manner they can uh, tracing uh, the, and, and also predicting some or simulating some 
uh, possibilities in, in the material side. So I, I want to ask you the relationship between the subject, uh, human being or designers, how they can like uh, embody their mind into this uh, material process. Do you think it which should be uh, just based on a separation because object itself have some intelligence. They can reorganize them by themselves by some geometry or the grammar based uh, uh, performance and how the human being can really find their relationship uh, to engage or to, uh, to, to go into this kind of relationship. So it, is that a separation process or is that a kind of uh, um, um, uh, engagement into each other. So how do you think of that? Mm. I would say that, you know, we, we never operate, computers never operate or our tools never operate in isolation of us, right? So, so you know, subjectivity gets embedded in multiple ways. It's embedded uh, in the tools that we choose and the ways in which we hybridize them and the things that we apply it to, it gets, um, it's embedded in it in the choices that we make. The, inform the choice of the information that we use, you know, like when I was showing, you you'll notice in the trajectory of the projects that the, the final projects make choices, let's say, um, like uh, Ron Rael and Virginia Sanfratello make choices about the kinds of material that they are going to use in 3D printing, right? Or, um, the living makes a choice about you know using salv reusing material like salvaged boards and uh and using an automated process to expose the grain of wood and to try to study what is already performative you know within that material system those choices are already what i will call subjective choices in the same way that uh, when I produce a multiple, you know, in let's say the porous skyscraper projects or um, the genetic algorithms that might produce a multiple or a multiplicity of possibilities, I'm involved in the selection process. And even if I say, no, I'm going to let the computer select, there at some point, it's through the programming itself you know, what are the variables, right? What are the weights within a swarming logic? I'm giving those weights, you know? So, so if we talk about the subjectivity, subjectivity happens through what we prioritize in that process and what the information is that goes in and also what are the things that we discover coming out? And I, I should also add, you know, within the context, let's say, of the one planet uh, that you used as the... Um, as the model, if I if I take an ecological perspective, I have I also have to get rid of the human, and this is why I I love you know what Neri Oxman might be doing with silkworms, right? Because I also have to get rid of the human as the single subject at the center of this. If I want to understand uh, how to think computation in relation to a material and natural or biotic world, I also have to engage others. Uh, or the intelligence of others somehow in this process. Uh, and that's a complex, in some ways for me, that's a complex process, but it's part of our next phase is really understanding uh, how we do this, right? In a, in a kind of uh, post-humanist uh, framework. Exactly, good, very good, interesting. Uh, so any um, uh, question from the floor uh, of the students? Ciao. Mm. Uh, hello. Mm. Oh, oh um, first, I want to thank you for the, for the fantastic and the very resourceful lecture. Um, well, um, I, I think it, it's, uh, it's, it, it gives us a, a, a overall view of the past 30 years, how digital transforms or reshapes architecture. And, and what I found very interesting is um, some of the projects shown in the lecture actually were not those projects they usually associated with, with, with digital or with the parametric. For example, uh, yeah. the Miya Ishigami's 
uh, kayak project. Yes. In, in fact, we, we could also argue some of them actually are not designed or made with computational or parametric tool yes. tools. Right. But, but from a conceptual or, or, or epistemological perspective, the project do have some commonalities with the project in the field of digital. So, so my question is, is there any intentions behind the selection of those projects? Or, or do you see architecture as a whole or somehow affect by the cultural transformation of the digital? So, so that would be my question. Yeah, so I think uh, it, it, what, you, what you said is exactly right. You know, for, for me, um, you know, for example, the early works by Office Da, the Casa La Roca, I mean, those were not done computationally. And, and the, the images were actually models, literally, you know, these teeny blocks of models built by hand. But the logic itself is computational, you know, and, uh, and that's what was interesting, you know, in the process, because it was a cultural shift from what became the model you know, computation became a model for rethinking architecture even before uh, architects had the tools, the computational or robotic tools. You know, the tools followed in some ways the cultural logic because the tools themselves are inventions. So, and they are cultural products in a way, they didn't just emerge. And so I think this is a, a kind of interesting way of understanding a feedback loop that exists within the system. It started, you know, in the in the '90s and early 2000s by architects. Even the early projects by by Greg Lynn, you know, under multi-agent systems. The first project that we have in the book is the, and we do this, you know, starting from a past seminal project, the stranded Sears Tower, you know, as a logic, as an idea, you know, and all the drawings I got from Greg were all, you know, drawings by hand. You know, they weren't like their their sketches done by hand, but the logic itself was the initiation of a computational logic, um, and and so this is the link for me between the cultural and the computational, and and how it evolves. Thank you. I think that it's the same reason we we always brought back uh, like works of Gaudi, the Fraudos works. They are not really computational, but the idea behind them is, is computation. Yeah. Well, you. well, you know, what's interesting about those projects, the projects by Gaudi and, and Otto, they're often talked about as material forms of computation, as, as material computation in and of itself, which is that um, matter producing a computational a, com a computational artifact in a way. And I think understanding the parallels between material computation and the processes that we're using becomes becomes a really critical link. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, uh, I remember Costas always differentiate two, two concepts of computational and uh, computerized. Yes. So, yeah, one is more about idea, one is another is about tools, techniques. Yeah. And and Com yeah. computerized, I had made the, the distinction at the beginning when I said it's about the shift in the ways of seeing, thinking, and models of space. So computerization makes no change necessarily to the, the kind of space or the kind of architecture, right? You know, BIM is the great example. We can have a, an arch uh, artifact that could have been built a hundred years ago, designed a hundred years ago, and it gets computerized, you know, it's mapped into a computer model, but the space itself or the way of thinking about material is not computational at all. You know, it's more the process uh, that we're using. And that for me is the distinction, you know, between the two terms. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you. So how about the students? Any question welcome? Okay, I think uh, it's a good honor to have um, um, Ayla here. And thanks a lot for the uh, profound um, uh, lecture, which actually gave us a lot of thinking on the computational thinking and the, also the history of the past uh, few years and which really changing our discipline. 
and give us another thinking uh, how should uh, we address our future research uh, in the uh, context of uh, digital futures. So thank you so much. Oh, for... thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Looking forward to read your new book. Yes. I will and... send you one as soon as <laughs> it's <time. laughs> I'm looking okay. forward to invite you to Shanghai uh, after COVID. Great. So, forward to Thanks. meet you. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, and great to see you, Jeff. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.